Well, how's everybody doing? <clears throat> all right, all right. Well, good deal. We're going to cover some things. We've been uh, talking about this the last couple of weeks, as a matter of fact. Uh, <clears throat> last couple of weeks, and everything's a big blurry usually anyway. It's hard for me to keep up with the days and what I did last Sunday. And <clears throat> pretty much every uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning, I'm texting my son-in-law, who does a lot of our uh, sound work and uh, the uh, video stuff. <clears throat> and I'll text him and say, hey, what did I wear last week? <laughs> Send me a picture, quick. So I, don't, so I don't want to wear the same thing again. So my wife will tell me you wore the same thing again. So I have to, and he'll send me a picture of the, from the video from last week. I'm like, okay, so I can't wear that. So I have to find something else. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but we were talking over the last couple of weeks about uh, just about faith in general. But there were some specific things that we talked about. We talked about how the fact that faith hears, right? <clears throat> how faith sees. What does faith see? Faith sees what can't be seen. And it says, while well, we're looking at the unseen, right? So we look at the unseen. We don't look at the seen. And the unseen is what's in the Word of God. That's the unseen in our life. We see it, but it's unseen in our life. So we look at the unseen. And when we look at the unseen instead of the seen, the unseen becomes the seen, right? And you keep looking at the unseen, and it becomes the truth. Well, it is the truth, and it becomes the fact, I should say. And so faith sees, uh, faith speaks. Last week I think we talked mainly about faith speaks, that we have believed and therefore we speak. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you believe is what you speak. And so we talked about how all these different aspects, we know that it says we are to walk by faith, so we know we walk by faith, so faith walks, right? We know that faith walks, we know that faith talks, we know that faith sees. And today we're going to talk about maybe not the last section of it, but it may or may not, I don't know yet, I'm just waiting to see. But we're going to talk about probably one of the most important parts of faith. And that is that faith acts. If there's no action, there's no faith. Right? Now the action doesn't always have to be physical action. Usually is. <clears throat> there's usually some type of physical action. As a matter of fact, if you read some of the different translations about it, it actually uses the terms like corresponding action. Right? So faith will have corresponding action. Faith always has something that matches what you're saying and what you're believing. So there has to be corresponding action. You can't say one thing and do something else, and, and meaning that you believe one thing and you're doing something else. What you do is really what you believe. Right? And so <clears throat> now there, that's on kind of a sliding scale to a degree as you grow in it you begin doing more and more of what you're actually believing and it becomes more pronounced. And that's why we have uh, people that we know are people of faith, that we remember them for their faith, like Smith Wigglesworth, John Lake, uh, for myself, Dr. Summerall, people like that, that their actions, <clears throat> while their actions might not have spoke louder than their words, their actions matched their words, right? And so we wanna talk about faith acts today. And if you talk about the fact that faith acts, then you will also be talking about faith acts. Acts of faith. Do you get it? So either way you want to read that, you can read it either way. It's both the same, right? <clears throat> faith acts. And if faith acts, then there are faith acts that take place because faith acts. <laughs> all right? So, all right. <clears throat> so how many of you know what we're talking about today? Faith acts, right? Okay. You ought to remember it by now. Okay. So go with me to Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to show you a couple of things. Uh, we'll end up probably in Hebrews 11, if we have enough time. And I'll show you some things even from there. But in Matthew chapter 12, it says, Behold, or and behold, let's get it right. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. Even the wording, a man which had his hand withered. Okay? And they ask him, talking about Jesus, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. Why did they do that? That they might accuse him. <clears throat> they, were, they were trying to trap him in his words. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and it, if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? <clears throat> now do you see what he's saying? <clears throat> Again, look at, you have to look at the context of what's being said here. Because he says, <clears throat> first off, there's a man with a withered arm, withered hand. <clears throat> and they say, is it right to heal this man? They knew what he was going to do. Yeah. 
what does that tell us? That <clears throat> notice, at this point, they haven't done anything. At this point, Jesus hadn't done anything, right? But they knew if he's around a guy with a withered hand, guess what he's going to do? <laughs> That's the reputation Jesus had, right? <clears throat> and so they ask him, well, is it lawful to do this so that they could accuse him? Now watch. <clears throat> he says in verse 12, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Verse 13, then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. He, he told him to do something. It was withered. You can't stretch forth a withered hand. Right? <clears throat> but so Jesus told this man to do what he could not do. Now watch this. He says, and he stretched it forth. So now he's, he did what he needed to do. But now notice, as he moved, it doesn't, it doesn't say, <clears throat> Jesus never said, hand be healed. He didn't lay hands on him from what we see here. Yeah. Right? He just told him, do what you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. If you remember the story last night, I was talking about the young man that had uh, mercury poisoning. And I just told him, well, what is it, if you could eat anything, because he couldn't eat anything. So well, what is it that you couldn't eat? Well, you know, if you could eat anything, what would you have? Oh, man, I'd love to have a vanilla shake from Jack in the Box. Mm -hmm. I'm like, go do it. Go drink it. And he went, and he was healed. Yeah. Right? He, I, I just, I didn't pray. <clears throat> I just told him to do what he could not do. Why? Because if he did, see, I had faith in God, and he had faith in the fact that if he did what I told him to do, he'd get healed. Right? And he did, and he was. Real simple. He acted on it. Now, he could have sat there and said, dude, I just told you. I can't eat anything. like He could have done that. And guess what? He wouldn't have got healed. Not that way. Now, I maybe could have laid hands on him or something, and I could have forced it on him, <clears throat> but he wouldn't have done it. But, and then, so that was to him. Now, what I didn't tell you last night is that <clears throat> this is the guy that started, that kept bringing everybody to my house. <laughs> the guy that played the pool, when he played pool, and he won money, he always made his living playing pool. And he was out in the bars, and he'd bring people to my house at 2 o'clock in the morning and everything else. And, you know, he sat out in front of my house and slept in his car one night and mm -hmm. just so he could get somebody in there the next day. Or, no, actually, so he could come as soon as he knew I was up. He asked me to go to the hospital with him. And so he was an evangelist. I mean, he was out there telling everybody, hey. I mean, there was people. Uh, there was a lady that, that, was with, uh, that worked in the bar and had some real severe digestive issues and things going on. And... He just happened to hear her mention it. And he said, well, what's going on? And she told him, he said, well, I got a guy that can fix that. <laughs> and she said, well, give me your doctor's name before I, you know, before I get off work. He said, well, he's not actually a doctor, but he can fix that. And then he told her about himself and how God had healed him. And he said, do you want me to take you to him? She said, sure. And so he literally, she took off work and he quit, I mean, he quit playing the pool quit playing the pool game, <clears throat> drove her out to the house, brought her up. I prayed for her at the front door. I don't even think she came in. Prayed for her at the front door. She went back to work, and within a couple of hours, she recognized she was healed. Right? It wasn't about, and, 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 and I didn't tell her, well, you know, you got to quit working in that bar. You got to quit doing it. Now, I, I mean, she, we talked a little bit, but it wasn't like, oh, you sent her, quit your job, and I'll pray for you. No, it wasn't that. The goodness of God draws men to repentance. Yes. Amen? So, now, now notice here. <clears throat> it says, uh, where are we at? Yeah. He said, then he said to the man, verse 13, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth. Notice he did exactly what he was told. Right? And it was restored whole like the other. Now, you also know the story of Naaman. <clears throat> here he is, a Syrian, and they really made him mad, that, or made people mad, that made the Israelites mad, uh, because here, he, here God's healing you know, uh, somebody outside the covenant, and Jesus even talked about him and, and said, you know, there was a lot of people around there at that time that were people of God and didn't get healed, didn't get these things, but here's a guy that got healed, and he wasn't even part of the covenant. Jesus talked about him. And so, remember that story. Here he is. He says uh, he's got all this leprosy going on, and it's made... Uh, that worked for him, said, uh, well, why don't you go over to Israel? There's a prophet over there who can take care of you. 
And so he went. You can imagine, here he is. He comes in with his entourage and all this kind of stuff. And he goes out and, you know, the servant comes out. Tell him, here, do this, do this, go do this. He said, I ain't going to go dip seven times in that muddy river Jordan. And then, he, of course, she said, well, if he told you, if he told you, if he told you to do something hard, you'd have done it. If he told you to do something you know, extravagant, you'd have done it. Why don't you just do this simple thing? Why? Because that was kind of beneath him, yeah. right? And so finally he went and did it. When he did it, he got healed. Now, you notice he didn't get healed till he went and did it, yep. right? Okay. So now look, John chapter 9. Let's go to John 9. <clears throat> Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. Spittle is a fancy name for a spit. Okay? <laughs> And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So now he took the clay made from spit and put it on the man's blind eyes. Right? Notice the man did not get healed. Didn't get healed. Right? Okay. Now watch. And he said unto him, <clears throat> Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, and washed, and came see. Isn't that just matter of fact? He told me, he said, go wash. He, I, mean, I mean, isn't that funny? It's, you think, you look at somebody, they, they, they get you dirty, and then they tell you to go wash. <laughs> right? Couldn't Jesus have done it another way? You would think he could have, right? But uh, here's a, another thing, and I wouldn't plan on saying this, but I'll go ahead and throw it out, because it is interesting that you don't notice it if you just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you get a synopsis or a harmony of the Gospels and you put them all together and you look at how they are, you will start to see how they're all, you know, woven together. <clears throat> Here's something that most people, I, honestly, I'd never heard any preacher mention it until I read some things by John Lake and he brought it up. But <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> and most people don't, again, if people would just read the Bible, you know, but they don't, and they surely don't sometimes read a harmony of Jesus' life, so you don't see the structure. Jesus, now I'll admit, when your first miracle is turning water to wine, that's a good start. <laughs> right there, bam, right? I mean, you know, I mean, come on, it, it would only have been better if it had turned it to Coca-Cola. <laughs> that's the only thing, okay. <laughs> okay. But. Coke by the keg. I like that. That's, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, no, actually. <laughs> but now notice though, here's, here, notice what he says. <clears throat> John Lake said, and he was talking about people, and he was talking about Jesus' ministry. Let me get back in the right story here. He was talking about Jesus starting his ministry. And he said, if you notice, yes, he started with a miracle, but if you look at the healings, <clears throat> Jesus was in ministry actually about four years, right? right at four years, because it mentions four different um, Passovers that he attended. So it wasn't actually three years, it was actually four. They were right at four. And the fourth one, he was crucified, <clears throat> basically. So <clears throat> whenever he, <clears throat> now, now listen, Gary, when he started, if you note the miracles that take place, they, they were miracles, they were healing, so they're all good. But if you look at each one, they get stronger and stronger and stronger and bigger and better. He didn't start off with a dead raisin. That came later. He grew. He grew. The Bible says he grew in favor. He grew in understanding. He grew in all. He, he grew. And then people say, well, Jesus healed to prove he was God. And if he did that to prove he was God, he didn't have to grow. The thing should have started. Now, admit it, he started with a good miracle, right? But as far as healings, they grew, and they got better and better. Now, <clears throat> and in the beginning, you'll see it was different things that were healed, different types of healings, and even some things like this. But then there were also times, uh, whenever you get in like, you know, here in John 9, things like that, where when it came to blind eyes and things, instead of him just opening them, there were things where he did like with mud and different things. There were times that he used... Well, uh, 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 props, that's not the word I wanted to use, but it, but it, it was the only word that came to mind. But it wasn't, you know, it was, it was props. He used things uh, to get things done. 
and amazingly, almost everything he used to get done, to get a healing done, always had something to do with water. Yep. Almost every time, spit, water, water into wine, something. Mm -hmm. Almost every time. <clears throat> now, and even whenever he loosed the tongue of the, the mute, the deaf mute, uh, he spit and put his finger on his tongue. So even then, it was water Ooh. in it. So over and over. But he actually, the healings got stronger and stronger. But now looking at John 9, when he put mud, when he spit and made the mud and put it on a man's eye. <clears throat> now, it doesn't give the details, but from all appearances, <clears throat> because many people back then would use poultices to put on wounds and different things like that. But notice this wasn't a poultice because they would also put other stuff into it in the sense of like herbs and things like that to get the you know, healing, nutritional part into it. <clears throat> but now, notice here, and, and almost all scholars look at this and agree that more than likely, since this man was born blind, right? Now watch, let's, let's go ahead and read what he says. Watch what he says. <clears throat> here he said, and he, he said, go wash, he made spittle, anointed the, the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he told him to go wash in the pool. So he could put the mud on his eyes and then told him to go wash it off. So he went and washed it off. Now, most scholars say, and I, it doesn't say this, so I can't say it, it's what happened. But there is a difference between how he ministered to this guy's eyes and ministered to other people's eyes. Another person, he just laid hands on his, he touched his eyes, and had to do it twice, of course, but he touched his eyes. And so why didn't he put mud on that guy's eyes? You know, was it just, I mean, he was around dirt and he had spit, so yeah. why not, you know? <laughs> so... But they say that they believe that the reason he did this was because that man was born blind and was born possibly without eyes. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. And humans were made from the dust of the earth. So if Jesus was going to create eyes, he would have had to use dirt to create it. And so that's what they say. But even this is a... It's a pretty major miracle. I mean, it's a pretty big deal when you start creating eyes. There's one thing, opening eyes, that's a big miracle. Creating eyes, that's, that's a pretty big miracle, right? But if you look at this, you can see that his healings got stronger, which means he grew and he learned and he got stronger in what he did. And part of that getting stronger, you know, one of the definitions of the word faith is confidence. That's one of the definitions. And then it's amazing because the more faith, let me put it this way, when you do something and it works, you get more confident. And when you get more confident, you're more confident to step out and do it again. And it gets stronger and stronger. And your confidence grows. And as your confidence grows, your faith grows. And it's funny because your confidence, you recognize that it's, it's God doing it. And your confidence in God grows. Because you think, well, he did it last time. He'll do it this time. Right? And so, and, and, and if you want to grow in that, then that means you always have to be doing something bigger. You have to be stretching. You have to be doing something more than you did before. Let me give you an example. In uh, Romans chapter 12, it talks about what is generally called the uh, motivational gifts. Teaching. You know. Isn't it funny? I, I was the other day I was reading through that. And it said, you know, this person's been, uh, their, their gift is uh, prophecy. Their gift is teaching. And there's a gift of giving. That's a gift. You know, there's not a gift of getting. <laughs> you ever notice that? There's a gift of giving, right? Probably because you need all the help from God you can get just to give it away, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, here, take it quick, take it, take it. <laughs> I don't know. But in, if you watch that, uh, matter of fact, let me, let's just turn over there real quick. Romans chapter 12. Wow. Way fast. There we go. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, notice what he says first, that you present your bodies first, not even that you present your spirits. It's a big deal. Present your bodies. Why? Because your bodies will give you problems, right? So he says, present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch this. And be not conformed. By, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you. What's he saying? I'm telling all of you. And I'm not leaving anybody out. Everybody. 
right? Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now we know that every man has the measure of faith, but Paul also said all men don't have faith, right? So if all men don't have faith, but if God has given every man the measure of faith, what's he talking about? Well, to all the people in the world, everybody, they don't have faith. But people in the church, everybody in the church has been given at least the measure of faith, right? Now, <clears throat> the thing is, is that Jesus was given the Spirit. See, all men had received the Spirit by measure up until that point. But the Bible says that Jesus received the Spirit without measure. Is that right? And I say, unfortunately, in the church, people talk about the spirit by measure. And they still talk about the spirit by measure. Yeah, they do. But the fact is, if we're in Christ and it's not us and it's him, then we don't even receive the spirit by measure. Why? Because we're, we receive of his spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. So if we receive of his spirit, listen, it's like being connected to the Internet. There's no end to the thing. If you're connected to Jesus, it's not you. See, people, what people do is it's like they go get plugged into Jesus, get charged, and walk away. Yeah. And now they're on their own. And they have this much. And however big they are in their spirit, that's how much faith, power, anointing, gifting, whatever it is that they can have. And then they tell you to you know, get more and get more and get more and grow. But the fact is, it's not like that. We're actually plugged into him, and there's a constant flow. When you're plugged into him, there's a constant flow. There is no degree. But when, if you think there's a degree, then, you're, then the, the outcome of thinking there's a degree you start thinking, oh, this problem's bigger than the last problem, and I can't handle it because I hadn't grown to that problem yet. And then people start saying, oh, I hope I have enough faith for this. I hope enough. Listen, if you had enough faith to get saved, you have enough faith for anything else you face. Yes. Right. Why? Because you getting saved was the hardest thing you ever did. It was the hardest thing. It was the most, most important, biggest spiritual thing you ever did, and you had no background with God, no connection with God, no, nothing to prove God by. And yet you had faith in him and you got saved. That's the greatest faith you can ever have. After that, everything's downhill. <laughs> Why? Why? Because after that, you've got, back, you've got history. Yep. You can look back and go, well, God saved me. Man, if he can save me, psh, he can fix this. Yeah. Right? Well, God healed me. If he can heal me with that, he can heal me with that. See? Yeah. So you start getting history. And actually, as you, now listen carefully. Actually, as the more history you get with God, the less faith is required but actually the more trust in him you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Faith is trust. I get that. But I'm saying we look at faith like a thing, like a certain amount. And we act sometimes as if our faith is something we get and we're like, okay, God, here's this. Is this enough? It's not that at all. Faith is trust in him that he keeps his word. It's not an amount. Or it couldn't be faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. We've talked about that this week. So... Now, looking at what he says here, let me get back and read this to you. He says um, in verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And watch this, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now watch this. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. You got that? Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So what does that mean? That means that I can prophesy. Or let me put it this way. I'll say what Paul said. That you may all prophesy. Isn't that what he said? Yes. You may all prophesy, Right? But if you're going to prophesy, you're going to prophesy to the proportion of your faith in prophesying. Do you get that? Okay. But you can grow. See, you can, you can trust God to supply your need. And you can say, he supplies my need through my job. Or you can say, I can trust God even more to a greater degree of trust to say, God supplies my need. Yeah, he used my job, but he, do, he goes beyond that. He's not limited to my job. So he can supply my need through other means. Whatever that is, God knows, and he can do it. Isn't that right? Now your proportion of faith for God providing for you has now increased. Right? Yeah. So your faith for each thing <clears throat> can increase. And usually your faith for anything increases based upon who you hang around. Faith is not a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. It's constantly... It, okay, I hate to say it, but the... 
Faith is a lot like the stock market. <laughs> it can be up or down on the same thing on any given day. You say, well, you know, how, how do you get that? Uh, look at the apostles. Matthew 9 and 10, they go out, they cast out devils. Everybody's saying, hey, even devils subject to us through your name. Matthew 17, why couldn't we cast this devil out? <laughs> they had faith one day for it, but they didn't have faith the next day for it. Their faith decreased. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, we got to get real with this stuff. This can't be all just, you know, floating around and, you know, avoiding the hard questions. Yeah. That's what made me kind of separate from the group at one time because I couldn't get anybody to talk about the hard questions. When I started asking them, I got started getting ostracized. So I thought, well, you're already treating me like I'm not here. I might as well leave. <laughs> and so I started digging in. And then I really went after it because I had nobody saying, don't ask that question. So I, but I didn't have anybody to ask, so I asked God. And I went to Scripture and found out most of the answers. And I did have some help with Wilfred Wright and Gertrude and them, and they were able to help me. I found recordings the other day. I, a bunch of our stuff is in boxes and all that kind of thing. And I found all the recordings I had of them where I'd been talking to them for four or five years at that point. And so I recorded all of our conversations. That was back in the day when you had a landline. If you're going to record a, a, a session, you know, a phone recording, you had to have a cassette tape deck yeah. and had to have the wire that you had the suction cup you had to stick on the back of the phone. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> and so I found all them whenever I got them. Back then it was cassette tapes, and then I had them all transferred over to CD, uh, CDD, I don't know what that is, but anyway, over to CD anyway. <laughs> So, you know, I was listening to him the other day. It was good going back and hearing Gertrude's voice and Will's voice. And all. It was just, you know, history. So, but you can have faith in certain areas, but your faith can fluctuate. That's why it's important that you stay around people. You stay around people that have no faith. Guess what? You're going to lose faith. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to talk you out of faith. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, take heed to what you hear. Yeah. Right? Take yeah. heed to what you hear. That's why you got to watch, watch. If you're going to watch television, you better be careful. But you got to watch it because, let me tell you, every you know, two and a half minutes, there's going to be drug commercials and sickness commercials and disease commercials. And, if, you know, you sit down feeling fine and get up and go to bed. And, oh, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, think, I think I may have some of that stuff they were talking about, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, you just start, you, why? Because it starts getting into you. And so you got to surround yourself with people who are going to talk faith, people who are going to talk that are going to help pull you up, you know. If you're the smartest person in the room, you need to hang out in a different room, right? Why? So you can grow. Amen? So, notice what he says here. Watch this. This, this. I'd never heard anybody teach on this until I read Dr. Lake talking about Jesus' ministry. And he didn't mention this, but it reminded me of this. So, it says here in verse uh, 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to, unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So you prophesy according to a proportion of faith for prophesying. Now, <clears throat> notice, uh, I'll give you an example. You have a person, you can go online and see some of these people, uh, but <clears throat> you can take somebody like uh, back in the day, the people I listened to back in the day, and I did, I, just listen, just because a man had a gift, and operated in a gift, and I watched how the gift operated, and I told God we needed that, doesn't mean I listened to all of his doctrine and believed all of his doctrine. Because yeah. some people, I, let me tell you, just because God operates a gift to a person does not mean he's vouching for their doctrine. Yes. They, there can be some weird doctrines out there with people that are really good at gifts, and they really function well. You say, well, why does that work? Because they have faith in God, that God will use them, and God wants to help people. Yes. And he'll bypass some of their stupid head stuff you know, there's a lot of people that need to actually, you know, God's brain bypass surgery. So that's what they need. But here he's got, so you got this guy uh, back in the day, it was a guy like William Branham. When he came to the operating gift of the word of knowledge, he was phenomenal. Gordon Lindsay said he saw him minister the word of knowledge hundreds, if not thousands of times, and he never saw him miss even one detail. Even one detail. Now think about that. All these things, you read some of the stories, some of the different things, amazing detail when it came to the, to, to the prophetic. Now, most people know me for ministering healing through authority, dominion, power, that kind of thing. Uh, we don't generally counsel and that kind of stuff to get people healed because Jesus didn't do it, so we don't do it. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, most people don't know me uh, for the prophetic aspect of the ministry. And yet even last night, and I wouldn't plan on prophesying to anybody or saying anything. But people, as I would begin to minister to them, they'd say, uh, you know, 
Do, do, do you think God has a word for me? And I said, I don't know, let's see. You know, we just start praying and I start praying and then stuff starts coming out. And from everything we gathered, I probably uh, prophesied to probably at least close to a dozen people, I guess, last night, maybe, somewhere around. I didn't count them, but about a dozen. To my knowledge, and, and after I spoke to them and said, okay, I always try to check, does that, sometimes you don't have to check, sometimes you can tell. It's hitting, why? Because of their reactions, right? But then there's other times you say, okay, what was it? And to my knowledge, we were uh, at least about 99% dead on accurate, as they would say, right? But, but people say, well, but I'm not known for that. Why? Because I don't, I don't emphasize that. It's there for the ministry for the person. I'm there to help the person. If, and that's what I'm trying to get across. If somebody needs a word, then I don't have to send them, oh, well, that's, that's not me, go so-and-so. No, it, it's not me anyway. It's the Holy Spirit in me, and he's got all the words. That's right? right? right. Uh, we shouldn't become a referral station, especially to other uh, you know, organizations. I'm talking about having to send the, 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 the homeless you know, down to something else to take care of them. We ought to be taking care of them. Church ought to take care of them. Yeah. Right? And so, <clears throat> but you can start to, to minister. And used to, I was, especially when I first started operating that way, I was really nervous about it. You know, oh, what if I get it wrong? What if I do this? And I'm, I'm like, well, what if, what if you pray for somebody they don't get healed? Same thing. I mean, I still did that, so why not do this, right? If people need help, let's trust God to help them. Right. And so we started ministering that way. And the first time I ever, well, I don't want to go too far in this because it's not that, but <clears throat> in the beginning it was really tough to do, but then now I just trust God and it flows pretty, you know, pretty regular actually. And, and I don't, uh, say, you know, thus saith the Lord. Uh, why? Because Jesus didn't. We just let the Spirit minister and just say, okay, was if that minister to you, does that, does that, you know, do, do you witness to that? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's good. But as I stepped out more and more, it got more and more accurate. When I was up at a Russian church in uh, Portland <clears throat> a few years ago, I guess two years ago when it was, um, ministered up there, and they asked me to come back that night and minister to the youth group. And I said, I went in there, and there was probably about 100, yeah, maybe 100, 150 kids in there, or something like that. And I ministered to them and just talked to them, you know. And then when we got done, they lined up mainly for healing. At least that's what I thought. And then I get in front of them, they go, I, I want a word from God. And I'm like, read your Bible. <laughs> there, there's your word from God right there, you know. <laughs> so, but, and they said, no, no, I, you know. And so I just say, okay, Father. You, know, I just, I, you start praying what you know in the name of Jesus, right? And I almost always start out to, if they ask me, I always start out the same way. Father, I thank you right now. Your will has been fulfilled in their life. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus that, that, they're, that, they're, that uh, their will is to step out into your will, and then, then all of a sudden stuff starts coming. Well, I, just, I just start, right? And just give him the opportunity to start speaking, and it gets, and, the, and that night, <clears throat> every person we spoke to, and literally I prophesied to every child, every child, every teenager in there. Every one of them went through the whole thing. Some of them came back two or three times even, and believe it or not, God had words that was bam, bam. And it was stuff like, uh, the book you've been thinking about writing, you need to write it. I mean, th specific things, things that are not just church stuff, you know? And these are teenagers. You're not thinking about teenagers writing books. I, I didn't anyway. And so it's stuff that seemed, I thought, boy, I hope this is right, you know? <laughs> And so it was a bunch of different stuff. But all I'm saying is the more I stretched, the more accurate it got. And so, but I had read this, and I understand, if we're going to prophesy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Well, if, but my proportion of faith, listen, we are, we are essentially, if you're born, quote, unquote, normal, we all have the same number of muscles. But how many of you know that your muscles are not all proportioned the same? Right? Some of us have got table muscle. <laughs> it's a little better developed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now there's muscles, right? But if you stretch them, they grow. And it's the same way. See, we all have been given the same measure of faith. And whenever we stand before God, he's going to say, what did you do with it? How much did you stretch it? I gave it to you. What did you do with it? Isn't that what the scripture says when, uh, before this uh, uh, wealthy owner uh, left. He, he, just, he deposited all his goods among his people, and he went on a long trip, and he came back and said, okay, what did you do with your talent? What did you do with your... And the talent, of course, is money and gold and that kind of stuff. He said, what did you do with your stuff? What did I get? Well, I knew you were a hard man, so I buried mine. I didn't do nothing with it. It's the only person. He said, take him out and beat him. 
All the other people, he, he, didn't, he didn't say, well, they got a, you know, 10 times, they got 100 times what I gave them. You're good. 10 times what I gave them. Oh, no, go get beaten. You didn't get enough. It's not about enough. It's doing something. Right? right? And one guy said, I buried mine. He said, oh, that's, you're a wicked servant. Right? And he t said, take him out and, and, and beat him. And so we have to realize we've all been given the same measure of faith, but we are now expected to use that measure of faith with whatever comes our way to develop that measure of faith and to make it stronger so that our faith muscle grows stronger. Yeah. Right? And it's the same thing in the area of prophecy. Now, years ago, and watching William Branham, I'd watch him on video, and he was just amazing. I mean, amazing. He just, he was one of the most unassuming people. The, Dr. Summerall knew him personally, because he was from Mishawaka in South Bend, is where Dr. Summerall was, and um, William Branham was from Mishawaka, so that's, that's like a suburb of South Bend, so they knew each other. And so he got together, and, and Dr. Summerall didn't agree with all of his doctrine, but he knew he was a, he was a man that loved God. And so he talked to me, he said, the most, he said the two most humble men he ever met, one was William Branham and the other was Billy Graham. Wow. Those are the two most humble men he'd ever met. And so he said, uh, about, <clears throat> we were talking about uh, whenever William Branham ministered in his church, and he talked about how he would uh, you know, just minister the word of knowledge, and then I had him on video, and here he is, he was a Baptist minister that his, went, he went through horrible things. Uh, his family was killed in a flood just washed away, his wife, his baby, I mean, just washed away. And he was a Baptist minister at the time, and he was a, like a game warden at one point, and just, and then one day, and when he was born, there were some strange things that happened, but then one day, he was out, and God spoke to him through an angel, and said, I'm giving you this, and giving you that, and this is the way it's gonna work, and if you do this, it'll work, and, and, and God told me, he said, I'm gonna give you a sign in your hand. Is one hand's gonna do this, and the other hand's gonna do that, and when you lay your hands on people, if it does that, it's a demon. If it does this, it's a sickness. Wow. It's just, you know, unusual type stuff. And he said, <clears throat> and he, he, he told me, he said, and if you, as you teach this, if you can get the people to believe you, he said, nothing will be able to stand before you. No sickness or disease will stand before you all the days of your life, not even cancer, because cancer was the big thing at the time. Still a big thing. Yeah. And so, he said, okay, I'll do it. And then he went, he, and again, he got kicked out of the Baptist church. And the only people that welcomed him in was what was generally called oneness Pentecostals, right? And so he was kind of welcomed in among them, which again, limited his circle because of the, their doctrinal position on God. But people loved the ministry and they needed help. And so you have him on video. I have him on video watching him. And he would have these huge meetings. He, he, was, he was the reason Gordon Lindsay started the Voice of Healing magazine. Because of that. And he told um, Jack Moore, you need to come see this guy. This guy, is, he's amazing. He said, the, the gift of the, of the word of knowledge is amazing. And so they went and watched him. And matter of fact, if you ever hear T.L. Osborne tell the story, he said he was in Portland and he saw this man. He never told who he was. Not for years he didn't tell who he was. But when he described what went on, I knew who he was and just by the, by the description. But he said, I was sitting up in the balcony, and T.L. Osborne was a pastor of the church there in McMinnville, just outside Portland. And he said, I watched this man, and this man, he said, he's very calm, very quiet. They, had to, they actually had to, to crank up his microphone to the point where the, the uh, PA systems were ringing wow. because he was so soft-spoken. And he would just stand there, and he'd say, well, now you, you, you know. You know I'm just here. I'm just a servant of the Lord. I'm just here. And, and I'm just, you know, just waiting uh, for, the, for the word of the Lord to come. And somebody, would, he'd say, okay, uh, bring the next person up. And they would come up. And he would just stand there for a few seconds, just look at him. And he'd say, uh, have we ever met? No. Okay. Um, matter of fact, uh, he'd say, you know, uh, we've never met. And matter of fact, uh, you weren't even going to come here. Uh, but your sister, you were actually going to come to my meeting in Jacksonville. But your sister wrote you a letter and told you I was going to be here and it's two hours closer to your house because you actually live at 1523 West Indiana Street. And he said, yeah, your house has a little white picket fence around it. And he said, those are some cute flowers there. He said, you got in the deal there. He said, and when you came down here, you came down with your husband. And he said, you rode down in the, in the it was a, it's, a, it's a black uh, 1946. And he, it gives a whole day. And he said, matter of fact, he said, uh, that you, you, the license plate on that car is da 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 da, -da And he just, he just read it out. And he said, matter of fact, he said, you came down with your husband. And he said, uh, where's your husband? Because she was sitting on the front. He said, uh, but you're, that, that man's not your husband. Was you? Oh, there's your husband over there. <laughs> and the man waved. I mean, that was going on. And he said, uh, now, 
He said, it's, 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 he turned to this woman, this woman, she just, <laughs> I mean, just, you know, because he's reading her mail. I mean, it's like zap, 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 you know. And, and he said, is this true? Yeah, it's true. It's not true. You know, and so he's like, all right, well, you can go your way. You're healed. If God told me all that about you, he loves you enough to heal you so you can go your way. Never even prayed for it. Just, just did. What, now, what was he doing? Now, here's the thing. The, now, watch this. You can get people healed with the word of knowledge, just like he did. Right? And then, so what he did was he said, as he told her this, he would tell her, he would use the gift. And as he told her the gift, her faith in God would rise. And when her faith in God rose, she got healed on her own faith. He didn't even give her faith. He didn't even do, he didn't even pray for her. He didn't even lay hands on her. And this was thousands of people. As a matter of fact, there were so many of them. Well, in the, in the evenings, he would have these big healing meetings, word of knowledge meetings, basically. And in the morning, to get in the healing meeting, you had to have a card with a number on it because he could only pray for so many people at a time. And so they would give out cards. To get the card, you had to go to the morning session, which was a teaching session that was taught by F.F. F. Bosworth. So he, you'd have to go to that and get the card and then get in line. And then when they called, we need cards number 1 through 50. And everybody would come up with 1 through 50. And if you had 51, you'd go tomorrow. And that's just the way it was. And so they'd bring them and just go through them, bloop, 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 and amazing, amazing things. And, and I watched him do this, and <clears throat> I started thinking, that's, that's the real. Now, in other areas, he was way off. His doctrine, some of his doctrine stuff, way off, right? And so, and then people exalt, because of that word of knowledge, people exalted him to the position of God. There were people that worshipped him when he died. He died just before Christmas, 1965. And just before he died, he was hit head on uh, by drunk drivers. <clears throat> the, the wreck, you, you ought to see the car. It was destroyed. And his wife was in the car with him and his daughter was in the car with him. His daughter was in the back seat and she was thrown in the floorboard up underneath the seat. He, he went through the windshield and was lying outside, kind of outside the car through the windshield. And his wife was still, had been thrown underneath the front dash and was also dead. And so Billy Paul, his son, went down the road and saw and said, I gotta go back and check on him. When he went back, he came on the wreck. And so when he came up on the wreck, he, he got out and he went over and William Brandon was still alive and he was lying there and he said, uh, Billy, because he couldn't move, he could not move anything. And he said, uh, Billy Paul, how's your mother? How's your mother? Because he couldn't see her. And Billy Paul looked at her and said, Dad, she's dead. He said, put my hand on her. And Billy Paul took his hand and put it over on her. She came back from the dead. Oh, wow. Then they took him all to the hospital. She was in the hospital. He lived a, a little bit longer and then passed away. And the daughter lived also. So, but now it's amazing, you know, how he operated in the word of knowledge. But then I was in Tulsa and I was watching uh, <clears throat> Richard Roberts. We actually <laughs> went to some place like a, I don't know, TJ Maxx or something like that. We were going in and my wife said, that's Richard Roberts. He was checking out, right? Believe it or not, famous people actually go regular places, right? <laughs> and and we're, I'm like, that is Richard Roberts. You know, and you just kind of, you want, you want to go say, hey, you know, appreciate this, appreciate that. Blah, blah, blah. And, but then at the same time, it's kind of like, you don't want to intrude. So you're kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, so you appreciate, but I'll do it from a distance, you know, and you just leave it alone. <clears throat> but I was watching Richard Roberts and he started moving into the word of knowledge. And as, as I was watching him, I'm sitting there watching him, and God started pointing out things. He said, watch this. He, and here's how he started ministering. He'd say, look. He said, okay, right over here in this section, right, right over here, right, right in here. He didn't know who. He said, right over here. There's somebody over here that has had uh, some back surgery. And uh, matter of fact, right now it's hurting you on the right, right hand side of your back. It's hurting right, and they're right in here. Who is that? And somebody go, yeah. Well, so he was right, but notice how general. I mean, and it was specific. That's still general. He couldn't tell the person, oh, it's you. He couldn't say your name. He could, you see what I'm saying? He couldn't give those things. But he was, it's very general. And I'm sitting there and I heard the Holy Spirit say, because I watched him and I heard the Holy Spirit say, if he continues, if he gets comfortable, this is as far as he'll go. But if he continues stretching and taking risk, this will get more specific and he can operate like William Brenham. Do you see that? Why? Because the gift often doesn't come full grown. Yeah. Why? Because there's faith involved. You, you, everybody wishes, or everybody thinks, it seems, oh, if I had a gift, this would just work, and that would just work. No, everything is by faith. 
So you have to have faith for it to work. And as you have faith, as your faith in God grows, you stretch and your gift grows. But if you don't stretch, if you get comfortable, or let me tell you this, okay, if you're in ministry and you get a reputation and then you get afraid to lose your reputation, you'll, you'll get to a place where it's good and then you'll, you'll get on cruise control. And you'll just stay there. Why? Because, you, you know, it's good. People getting help. But you know you could go further. But you don't because what if I'm wrong? I'm going to lose my reputation. I'm going to lose the, I'll lose the people. And so we always have to remember, it's not about your reputation. It's not about you losing the people. If God gave you the people, he'll keep the people. And if God gave them to you, and if he doesn't, then they leave, and then you, he'll give you new ones. Yeah. Right? But you, we all have to grow. So we have to stay out of our comfort zone and stretch and grow and, and trust God more. And if we do, because look at Jesus. Look how Jesus did. Jesus is pretty, you know, pretty accurate, right? Yeah, you're telling the truth. That man you're with ain't your husband. You've had five other husbands, and the one you're with now, I mean, come on, you know? Uh, and when he, when he saw, um, was it Andrew? You know, I saw you sitting over here, and you, here's an Israelite without guile, right? Here's an Israelite without guile. How does he know that? Prophetic. He knows, right? Because he was the, the quintessential prophet, right? And so we need to look at operating like he did, not like any one person, but you can find people that specialize. Now, we're not necessarily supposed to be specialists, but we can find people that have specialized and do good in that area, and we can get with them, and we can get that DNA, and we can get over in that area, and we can get around them, we can begin to minister like them, and then when we get that, we can get around another person that does it this way, and pretty soon we're, we're fully uh, clothed, you might say. We're fully grown in those areas. Amen? But you can prophesy by, by, by degree. <clears throat> well, it's the same thing in healing. See, most people want instant healing. To, yes, we all do. Okay, I got it. Okay? At the same time, you grow. You grow. That's why there's all kinds of ways to do things, and I, I haven't got a chance to really share some of them, but there's some things. If you want, go back and watch our early videos. <clears throat> in our early videos, there were things I was doing there was times when I would minister, if, if, I, if it was a disease I was familiar with and it seemed beaten a lot, I'd just blast it. Just, yeah, watch this. Here we go. Bam. Hit that thing, right? But then if it wasn't that, let's say I'd never heard of it, or let's say it was something that I had heard of but hadn't seen a lot of success in. Had seen some, but maybe not a lot. Then I would, many times it'd be, I would tell the people, it's like I would do it in a group, or I would say, you know what, uh, I'll, I'll pray for you tonight at the healing service. And so we get everybody there, and I'd get everybody up and say, all right, say this with me. In the name of Jesus. And everybody repeat it. In the name of Jesus. I say, when my brother, when my brother lays his hands upon me, lays his hands upon me, I shall be made whole. I shall be made whole. What am I doing? I'm getting them to repeat. And then I say, I'm listening. <clears throat> and if I say, say this with me, in the name of Jesus. And I hear, in the name of Jesus. Now, are they saying the same thing I said? Saying the same thing? Or are they saying the same way? No. And I'm, I'll get more, more aggressive. And I'll get louder. I'll get stronger. Say it this way. Say it this way. Do it this way. And I'm waiting. I'm listening. And when I get them saying it with the same aggression back, then I say, okay, now we're there. Now I can pray for you. Now I can lay hands. Why? Because I've stirred you up to where now if I lay hands on you, you're going to get it. And, it. and I'm saying, you say, when my brother lays his hands on me. See, if you just go, when my brother lays his hands on me, I'm going to be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> when my brother lays it. See, you can do that. Or, or you'd be saying, when my brother lays his hands on me, I'm going to get healed. I'm going to get healed. And I'm like, okay, you're ready. And say, what was I doing? I was getting, I was actually getting you to help me help you. Right. You get it? Now, I'd much rather just jumped out there and did it. But I was growing. Yeah. And so I had to figure out, because the bottom line is, I want you healed. So I grew. And as I, as I learned how to do these things, I would start to say, okay, we can do it that way. And so I started growing. And, I, and if, I, if I did it four or five times, and people are still like, you know, if, when my brother lays his hands on me, I I'm like, okay, let's go around the mountain again. We'll just go around that mountain again. You want to go around the wilderness one more time? We can go around the wilderness one more time, right? Uh, Israelites did it for 40 years. We can do it another trip. <laughs> yeah. And we'd take them around. I'd start all over again. Say this with me. Say this with me. And I, I would get them to start to rear up. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm pulling that fight up out of them because yeah. nobody fights quietly. That's right. right. You look at two people arguing. They ain't quiet. Right? Yeah, they get loud. That's right. They're going after it, right? And that's sometimes how you have to do the devil. Not because he won't listen, but because you've got to stir up the fortitude in you to go, you know what? It's going to be this way. 
I'm not putting up with that. And you have to get that aggressiveness out of your spirit. Why? Because the Jesus in you is aggressive. Right? He wasn't defensive. He was aggressive. Look, he never, most of the time when people say, especially the Pharisees say something to him, he didn't even answer them. He would aggressively go back after them. You know? Oh, we know this. We know this about you. Yeah, well, you know, who, who's your parents? He, he would turn around and go, well, you know, who is this to you? Look, you? You'll travel across land and sea to make a disciple, and they're just twice the child of hell are you that you are. That's pretty aggressive, yeah. right? You know, I've been pretty harsh on people sometimes, but I ain't called anybody, you know, whitewashed graves. <laughs> right? I hadn't looked at anybody and said, you viper. <laughs> you know, I had a den of thieves, and I hadn't done that. There have been a couple of times I wanted to use that one. I've gone to a couple of conferences and stuff, you know, wanted to turn over tables and things, but <laughs> when people try to sell you what you already got, it kind of gets upsetting. Yeah. But you see, all I'm trying to say is that we can grow. You can grow in faith. You can grow in prophesying. You can grow in these things. But the problem is everybody wants to start at 100%. Yeah. Yeah? Nobody gets to start as the world champion. Yeah. Everybody has to fight their way through and become a contender. Yeah. Amen? And we're not fighting with flesh and blood. And hopefully you're not contending with other people. But you have to grow. You have to start somewhere. And if you look at it, you know, it's amazing how everybody watches all these fights and pays lots of money to go and sit there and watch these guys fight. And the fight, and the, you know, if, if it's a really good fighter, fight don't last long. They'll pay hundreds of dollars, if not thousands, to watch a guy walk across the ring and knock a guy out. It's over. And you're like, oh, man thousand dollars you know for three seconds yeah. right <clears throat> and so but these guys and you look you know why he can knock him out in three seconds because he spent three thousand hours in the gym and see, we want to go to walmart and walk through and just bam 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 and you don't want to spend any time in the world you don't want to spend any time with god you don't want to, to think about things you you want to keep your mind somewhere else yeah. and not think about these things this is what, when I'm driving, when I'm riding, if I have somebody with me, this is what we talk about. We talk about how, how do we grow? How do we do these things? How, we, how can we get this message across stronger to the people? How can we get people doing it? It's not about how can, you know, we get uh, more famous or richer. And that, that's not what we're doing. We're talking about the message. We're talking about trying to grow uh, people. And so, but you do that by not doing, oh, let me put it this way. <clears throat> you can't get where you're going by just continuing to do what you've been doing. Yeah. If you want what you never had, you've got to do what you've never done. Yeah. It's that simple, wow. right? And with me, I told you from the beginning, I'm a, I'm a, you can tell, even, you know, even now, of course, but you know, I'm just a quiet, average person. I, li you know, I like to sit and read, and I like quiet and peace and you know, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's why I like to live. Yeah. But yet at the same time, I knew, and this is what God showed me. He said, listen, if you're going to help these people, you've got to get over yourself. You got to get out of yourself. And I said, I'll do whatever I have to do. And God said, will you? Will you do whatever you have to do to get these people free? Will you do whatever you have to do to get that person's child healed? I said, yes, sir. I will do whatever I have to do. He said, will you not act like you? I'm like, if I have to. I said, who would I have to act like? He said, well, who have you been, who have I been showing you who to get around? Who have I been putting you around? Who's come across your path? Who have you been watching on the videos? Act, act like that. And I started acting, like I told you last night. I was acting in the beginning. And I had to develop that aggressiveness. I had to develop that in me. And I'm still a quiet person. But let me tell you, when it comes to sickness and disease or babies or something like that, I can get real aggressive real quick. And I really don't care if anybody likes it or not. I could care less what people think about it. <laughs> right? Why? Because that baby's life is on the, on the, on the line. Right. I don't want them standing next to a grave. Right? So I get aggressive. And, and to be honest with you, I've never, you know, people say, well, we know we just don't feel love from, from, the, uh, from Curry Blake. We don't feel love coming out of him, you know, like we do this person. I'm like, you don't even know what love is. See? But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right? Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. He didn't say no man has greater love. They give you the warm fuzzies. Right? And see what most people don't know, or maybe some of you do, but I decided a long time ago, I would lay my life down. See, whenever I, I wasn't doing things I wanted to do. 
when thing, other people were doing things, guess what I was doing? I was sitting at home, going through the words, looking up the Greek, going through the Hebrew, talking to God about it, figuring out how it worked. What was I doing? I was laying my life down for others. And people say, well, we don't feel love. I can show you some tough love. <laughs> Does this make sense to you? Yes. Listen, you, listen, you don't feel love. Love is a spirit. His name is God. His name is, amen? You don't feel love. You experience it. You, you can see the results of it. Okay? Okay, if, if God is a spirit, and God is love. Then love is a spirit. And Jesus said, uh, the spirit is like this. You don't see him. You don't even, you can't see where he comes from or where he goes. All you can do is see if the leaves rattle, you know he's been present by the results. So when people say things like that, well, you know, it's love, what is love? We don't feel love. And it's, I'm like, you don't know what love is. Love is, is the fact that I will fight to the death for you. That I will not quit. That I keep on going. Bless you. Amen. <laughs> that I will bless. Amen. That I will. That I will continue. I don't stop. I don't quit. I don't back off. That's love. Even if you come and say, "Okay, stop, please." No, too bad. Don't bring it to me. We don't quit. Right. So that's what love is. Love doesn't quit. Love never fails. Why does it never fail? Because it never quits. Amen. Right. So you can prophesy, you can step out in these things. If you're going to be like Jesus, that's what you have to do. You have to start stepping out, stretching. Yeah. But your stretching is not just for your stuff. That's, that's the worst thing about most of the faith message that's out there today. It, it's, it's not reaching out to others. It's not showing you my love for you and for God by me using my faith for you to get you free. It's me telling you what my faith has got me. See, my faith got me a new car. My faith got me a new house. My, my faith keeps me he healthy. And, you know, if you get some faith, you can get it too. But, you know, I can't help you there. So, <clears throat> and that's the problem. You don't have faith just for yourself. If God gave you faith to raise the dead, guess what? It ain't faith to raise yourself. Yeah. Amen? If it's faith to heal the sick, it's not for you unless you need it, of course. But primarily, it's for other people. Yeah. God gives gifts for you to use for other people. That's why we're all part of the body. We all need each other. Right? There's areas that, that, that we need help in. Everybody needs help in, in, in different areas of their life. And so we have to learn to be able to walk in love, which means many times ignore what somebody says and help them anyway. Wow. Ignore what they're saying to you. Ignore what they've said about you. And just help them anyway. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So you can prophesy by proportion. And the, and the more you stretch, the greater the degree it gets, the more accurate it'll get. Well, it's the same thing with faith. You can get more faith for faith in that sense. You can get more faith in healing, and your, your healings will get stronger, and your healings will get different, right? You'll grow. There's growth. Everybody wants to start at the top. Nobody starts at the top. Nobody starts, generally speaking, nobody starts at 100% of anything, right? It's, it's called practice. Even doctors have a practice, and they're practicing on you. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you understand? So, amen. That's right. You know, that's why even the DHT, we call it Divine Healing Technician Training. But honestly, the, the training part, what we did here this week, by the end of that, you're not a Divine Healing Technician. Technically, at that point, at best, you're a Divine Healing Practitioner. Hopefully, that's what you become. Hopefully, that's what you are. And then when you do that for a while and you, uh, you contact us and show us that you're doing it and getting results or asking questions and getting answers and then you're correcting things and you're doing it better and getting people help, then, usually after about three months or so, then we say you're a certified divine healing technician. Why? Because you know what you're doing. Yeah. And that's when we start sending you uh, prayer requests and things that come into your area and we plug in with you and somebody calls us from your area we say hey we got somebody here and we send them we send you their information so you can contact them say hey, why because it's responsibility comes with this there's a responsibility you know if you don't generally if you don't have responsibility you don't have any authority if you have a child and you don't take responsibility for that child the state will take away your authority over that child so you have to take responsibility, and with responsibility comes that authority. Jesus gave us that authority, but you have to pick it up. When you pick it up, that's called taking responsibility. You get that? Yes. 
Now, real quick, I'll say that. Let's get back over here. It says there in verse 7, our ministry, let us wait on our ministering. In other words, wait expectantly and, and use it. Or he that teaches on teaching, he that exhorts on exhortation, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity. Don't make a big show out of it, right? Do it with simplicity. Don't blow the trumpets. Don't get everybody's attention, you know. I'm writing a check. It's a big one. Here we go. Where everybody sit. No, don't, come on, don't do that. Right? <clears throat> he that rules, do it with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Right? So you can see that this is all, all these things start to grow and you stretch and they grow. Now, I want to take you back to where we were real quick. Yeah. <clears throat> In Hebrews 11, we're just going to run through this. It ain't going to take me just a minute. Right? To just a minute. But in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen for it, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Right? <clears throat> now, and look at verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God. What are we talking about? Faith acts. Yes. By faith Abel offered. Notice, Abel did not make a vow. Faith makes an offering. You see that? Yeah. Faith offered. He offered something. He had faith. He offered. He made an offering. He didn't make a vow. He didn't make a pledge. He didn't make a promise. I'm going to do this. Right? He said he made an offering. He, he, he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Look, and we're not going to read all of it. Go down. By faith, Enoch was translated. Shouldn't see death was not found because God had translated him. But now look, and it was because before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. <clears throat> now, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Pretty simple. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark. You hear that? By faith, prepared an ark. What did he do? It was a faith act, right? Yes. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out. He didn't talk about it. He didn't plan it. He went out, right? He left. Not knowing where he went, whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, <clears throat> as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, Isaac and Jacob, heirs, of him, uh, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city that had foundations. His builder and maker was God. And going down, we keep, you notice all these people did things. You get that? All these people did things. They didn't just, well, I have faith and I'm just going to sit here. Right? That's why I tell you, listen, if I pray for you, if I lay hands on you, uh, whatever it is you couldn't do, do it. And keep doing it until you're doing it normal. I don't care what you can do. If, if all you can do is, uh, I can, man, I wish I had more time. I can tell you more testimonies. There was a guy up in Portland, or you see I said, and I just go right on into it anyway. So I just, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we were up in, uh, we were at Warner, Warner Pacific College in Portland, Oregon, doing a DHT. Had 1,400 people there we were training. In one day, it was amazing. I was up on this platform to, to pray for people. We had to bring them up in groups of 50 and line them up on the platform. I'd pray for them. They'd go back off because the, the grass was kind of like it was so crowded that we couldn't even get down there to pray for people. And the first day we were there, there was a man that they brought in on a stretcher. I mean, we're talking about a full-blown hospital stretcher, the whole bit, right? Uh, medical professionals watching him. He was paralyzed from the neck, actually from the top of the neck down. He could do nothing. He could move his eyes. That's it. And he was lying there. He couldn't move anything, right? He was a young man, and he had been in a motorcycle accident, crippling, paralyzed. They said, he's not even going to live, let alone ever walk again, right? And so they bring him in in this stretcher. He's lying there, and I'm just going back and forth, and we start to pray for people because we, we don't want to wait till the last day. So we started praying for him. We started commanding healing, and we started ministering. And then uh, when we did have the healing service the last day, we were standing there, and I would go back and forth. And I went down, laid hands on him, one on his arm, one on his leg, just not that that's important. I'm just saying it wasn't some super spiritual ritual, you know, uh, religious ritual, right? I just walked up next to him and put my hands on him. 
In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, right now, body, you be healed. You function correctly. Every limb will function correctly. Every organ in the body, you begin to function correctly. Right now, in the name of Jesus, it'll be this way and no other. And I don't mean maybe. <laughs> and where'd I get that from? I heard Dr. Summerall say that a thousand times. Right? And so, then, I, I just, there was nothing. Nothing happened. I turned around, went back, got on the platform, prayed for some more people. A few minutes, I mean, it's a crowd. It's, it's a crowd there. A lot of noise, you know, people talking. And so about that time, I heard this man, I heard some people down there, it was like, a, like last night, when you, you're ministering going on, and all of a sudden you hear part of the crowd start to cheer, and you know something happened. You don't know what happened, but you know something happened. And so I looked down, I said, what's going on? What, what, what was that? And they said, uh, he, we, we touched his toe. He can feel his toe. <laughs> he, he couldn't feel anything. Yeah. But, but they said, he, he, we can, he can feel his toe. He couldn't move his toe, but he could feel his toe. Right? said, okay, Jesus' name, be healed, rest of the way. We don't, we, God doesn't do anything partial. What he starts, he finishes. That's right. We don't stop halfway. We say in the name of Jesus, total, complete healing in Jesus' name. Went back, started praying for people. A few minutes later, more cheering. <laughs> All right, what's going on now? He can feel his legs. He can feel it. See, most people say, well, it wasn't instant. He didn't jump out and run around. Yeah, well, you know, you need to jump out and run around. <laughs> okay, All right. All right. okay. Yeah. All right, doesn't matter. We're getting it. Right? We're getting it. Yes. Everybody thinks Jesus, all Jesus' healings were instant. They weren't. There were several times they said, and the boy began to amend mm -hmm. from that hour. Yes. That's why it says, and they, you lay in some sick and they shall recover. Yes. Recovery can take some time. Amen? Amen? And so, this guy's this. And now, now, here's the thing. When we left that night, it was the last night, we left. And when we left, he had feeling, but he couldn't move anything. Right? So I don't like that. Yeah. You know, I want him to get up. And so, but he didn't. And so I don't make a show of him. I don't try to pull him out and, you know, and do that kind of stuff. So we just let it go, you know, at that sense. And so we went out. On the way out, we stopped at an Applebee's to eat. And there was a couple there. They were sitting there, and they said, Brother Curry, when we walked past, Brother Curry, I said, oh, hey, how's it going? And uh, they said, you're in town? I said, yeah, we just finished a three-day DHT. Oh, we didn't even know you were here. And I said, yeah, we've been here, you know about a week now, and they said, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, the guy said, my wife was in your healing service uh, two years ago when you were here. And I said, oh, okay, because I didn't remember. They looked kind of familiar, but I didn't remember. I said, okay, well, how, how's it going? Yeah, she had breast cancer. The doctor said, four, uh, uh, stage four uh, metastasis, it's, it's, it's over. And she's sitting there healthy, and she goes, totally healed, totally healed. And I'm like, I'm like glory to God, glory to God, amen. All right? And so here we are in Applebee's, and this woman's giving her testimony. And I said, well, that's class that I, I, I didn't know. I said, she goes, yeah. And the man said, you know, we keep trying to remember to write, and we keep thinking we're going to write to you and tell you, but we, didn't, we just never get around to it. That's what happens all the time. Yeah. Ele, you know, ten lepers were healed. Oh, that's right. how, many, how, many, how many came back and testified? One. So ten, so uh, now get this, <clears throat> and this is so normal usually you hear of about 10% of what actually happened. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then people say, well, why, didn't, why didn't more happen? Well, you didn't go home with everybody last night. That's right. You watch. We'll be getting the testimonies from it, and that's what happens. It happened with Jesus. Everybody thinks, that, well, you know, if it's Jesus, it, everybody would have been healed right then and been the answer. No, yeah. no. Everybody would have got healed, but it might take a little bit of time, right? Because there are certain things that have to be done. If it's structural, if it has to do with a, uh, you know, bones and things like that, God doesn't just go, you know, and hurt you because it hurts. Yeah. When, when bones are, it hurts. So God, usually what happens is people go home, go to sleep. When they wake up the next morning, they're completely well. Yeah. It's, if it's structural. Why? Because God does it while you sleep. You say, well, show me an example of that. Adam. Mm -hmm. right? Adam, God took a rib out of Adam. What did he do first? Put him to sleep. He did it while Adam slept. Right? He still does healings and things like that while people sleep. The one with the, all that metal came out of her back. She was sleeping, never felt it till she woke up and then felt it in the bed. Right? It's, that's why I try to get across people. Healing and all, and miracles, they're not like you think. They're usually not like you see on some of the shows and things like that. But usually when people get a miracle, they're not exuberant. You would think they'd be, wow. I mean, and sometimes they are, but most of the time, they're in shock. They can't believe it. The pain's gone. First time in 15 years. I hadn't had pain. First time I can tell. This is amazing. And they're just in shock. 
And then we hear about it later on. And a lot of them go, well, is it real? Is it real? Is it? And, they, and they wait a week to see if it's real. And then we hear from them, right? And so this man, I've been talking to these people, and they tell me about this cancer. And we're saying, now me, I've never tasted alcohol, right? Uh, my dad was an alcoholic, and I was raised in church where alcohol was a sin, right? It's just, that's the way it was. And I made a vow uh, when I was nine years old. I'd never touch alcohol because I saw what he did for, for my family. I said, I just won't do it. So I don't do it, right? Never have done it. Never. And now I've never had any desire. When I was in the nightclubs, people would buy drinks, come bring them, put them on my table, say, hey, that, that's yours. And, it's, and I'd look, it looks like a Coke. And it would be a bourbon and Coke, right? I'd go over and pick them. Oh, thank you. you know, yeah. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I could have done it. It's no big deal. But I made a vow to God. And, and it never, I was never even tempted. Mm. Never even tempted to try it. Yeah. Why? Because I hate it. Why? Because I saw what it did to my family. Yeah. So it's easy for me. Not to do it. So <clears throat> now... And these, this couple's sitting there, and they're both drinking. They got beer in front of them, you know, big, big, glasses, big glasses of beer <laughs> in front of them. You know, and my natural instinct is look at that and go, ah, okay. got you healed, now we got to get you saved. <laughs> you know, <that's>, you know. <clears throat> when I went to Italy, man, it, at lunch, when they bring out the lunch, you're walking around, and they got the food everywhere, and, you know, and I'm trying to get a Coke, and they're walking around with... And they go, oh, you want some beer? If you want the beer, you have vino. You I'm like, no, no, you know, we're having a healing service, and it needs to be an evangelistic service. <laughs> I need to get you all saved, you know. But it's just, it's their culture, and, and nobody got drunk. I mean, they can drink and not get drunk. It's amazing, right? I can, I could probably smell it and get drunk. I don't know, have a, have a very low tolerance for it. Okay, but so <clears throat> they're, they're drinking, and yet, you know, I'm, I, I don't say anything, right? And, so I was, and they said, well, be sure to let us know when you're coming up next. I said, well, write your testimony. Give me your address. We'll send it in. So anyway, we go back home. Two years later, I'm back up in that area. I'm in a Best Western Hotel meeting room. Um, I met some of John Lake's family. They were there. Uh, Lake's son, Otto, uh, his granddaughter was there. I met her. I met uh, Roy Ferguson, which was actually uh, married into the Lake family. He was there, elderly. I mean, he was in his 90s, and he's sitting back there at the back. And it was so funny because he'd listen. He'd go, "Amen, glory, amen." <laughs> it was a funny thing. <laughs> and we had a little woman that was with uh, Smith Wigglesworth for years. Had had Wigglesworth had prayed for, her, and then we were in Colorado, and she came there, and they she called him home. She goes, "Are are, are these Holy Ghost meetings?" I said, "Yes, ma'am, they are." She said, are, they, are, they, are, you, are you people alive? I'm like, yes, ma'am. She goes, well, good. She said, I can't get around dead people. I'll die. I'm too old. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, yes, ma'am, we're alive. We're alive. And so they brought her over there, and they set her on the front row, and it's, it's an amazing little woman. And, and so as soon as I saw her, I went over, and I shook her hand. I said, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And so I just got down on my knees. I said, put your hand right there. Now you pray for me. And I had her praying for me. And because I, I believe in, you know, these old saints, they, they, you don't get old being stupid, That's right. you know. And so they know some stuff. And so I'm, I'm like, and I got around Simeon Stewart, and he was elderly, been ordained by A. Allen, and amazing, had a strong prophetic uh, influence in my life. And every time I got around, put your hand right there, pray, pray, pray. And he prophesied some things that even today are coming to pass. Wow. It's amazing. And he's been gone now 10 years. But God had him in my life, and it was vitally important. He confirmed some things that God told me. I never told anybody, but God confirmed them. And if it, he had not done that, I probably never would have actually fully accepted it, what he was saying, because there were certain things it was just hard for me to accept for myself. So <clears throat> anyway... This, uh, I'm in this meeting room, I'm, I'm having a meeting, and I'm saying, okay, we're going to take a break. And just before I take a break, uh, this person walks in the back, by the back door, back there, and he's in a suit. And so I, you know, I don't think anything, so I'm taking a break, and I start to walk past, and as I walk past him, he says, uh, Brother Curry, and I stop, and I said, yeah. And he said, uh, do you remember me? And I said, you look familiar, but I can't remember where. He goes, uh, two years ago, Warner Pacific College, on the stretcher. Wow. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I look at him like, Whoa. I'm like, what happened? He said, he said, I went home. He said, that night I went home, and they put me out of the, the bed thing that they brought him in the stretcher and put him in his bed. And he said, and the next morning when I woke up, I didn't even think about it. I rolled out of bed, stood up, and walked across the room, and then realized I was walking. Oh. And then, and so, so I'm, I'm like, 
man, that's, that's awesome to see you. I said, this is, this is awesome. And I said, no, I didn't, didn't know what happened to you. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, I've been traveling. People have been asking me to give my testimony, and people knew. So I've been, he said, I, you know, I never knew I was supposed to be in ministry. He said, but apparently, you know. <laughs> and so, so, but it happened. But for two years, I didn't know anything. But now here's the thing. When I go off on trips, many times my wife would call me at the end of a meeting or something like last night before I got back home. You know, we were talking, and she said, uh, so, so how'd it go? And I'm like, it was good. It was good. Yep, it's in. We're going to use this one, replace uh, the other DHT, and use this DHT as the one that we put out. And so we were talking about the different things and talking about the people and all this. And, um, and, and I, I, said, I, had to, I said, I had to pray for everybody by myself. I didn't have anybody. Uh, we didn't do it like we normally do. I said, and she said, why? I said, because were, it was too packed. We couldn't have done it that way. It would have been too confusing. She goes, you, so the bigger the meetings you get, the more you're going to have to pray by yourself? I'm like, sometimes, you know. <laughs> But, I mean, I prayed for, you know, 3,000 people, so, you know, three to 400 wasn't that bad. And so, but whenever you, uh, what we're talking about, though, is that this, how this young man, I didn't even know what went on, but when my wife would call me after these meetings, she would say, um, you know, what, what happened? And, and in the very beginning, many times she'd say, uh, so what did you see? You know, what big miracle did you see? And I, this time when I was leaving from Portland with that guy before I, you know, when he was still on the stretcher. She said, well, so what? I said, I said, a uh, guy on the stretcher got healed? I said, there were some other people, and I gave some other testimonies. And she said, so what happened? What'd you see? And I said, well, I didn't see anything. She said, well, but you said he got healed. I said, he got healed. Why? Because I laid hands on the sick and they recovered. That's right. Right? And that was it. Now, I didn't go off telling, oh, and this man got healed. And I, didn't, I didn't tell anybody else. But if somebody had asked me, I said, yeah. Why? Because I believe it. I believe if I lay hands on them, they're going, they're going to recover. It's that simple. I don't have to hear the testimony, but I want the testimony. I'm not going to go off going, well, I laid hands on 500 people last night. 500 people got healed. It was great. You know? But do I believe that? Yeah. And I believe that it will, we will see it. Right? Will we see some instant? Okay, listen. It, it's like Wigglesworth said, first the, the, the ear, then the grain in the ear, and then the full corn. Right? So there's different degrees of it that you see little by little. Yeah. Right? It's just like the soil... 30, 60, 100 fold. You might see 30 fold the first night, 60 fold two days later, and 100 fold a week down the road. Yeah. It's, it's a principle, it's a biblical principle. But people don't like that, why? Well, I'm sorry it doesn't fit your standards of what, <laughs> of what Hollywood has built you up to believe a certain way. Because yeah. okay? I guarantee you when Jesus cast the devil out of the boy, it wasn't like in Jesus of Nazareth where the boy is up against a wall and Jesus is in the door and the shadow and the light's behind him and the shadow is casting a shadow on the demon-possessed boy and Jesus standing there, and he had that perfect theatrical voice, and he goes, leave him. <laughs> I guarantee it wasn't that way, right? You know, it's amazing. You listen to people, and you look at people, and like, you, yeah, who knows what Jesus' voice sounded like? We have an idea that it was perfect, you know? And he was perfect, so I guess perfect is whatever his voice sounded like, right? But you, you look at somebody like George Patton, blood and guts Patton, as you know, a main aggressive leader and commander and all this, and then you, you, you listen to a recording of him. And his voice was like this. <laughs> it's like, that's why when people drove past, he didn't say anything. He would just salute, send them to the front, go. And he, he practiced, he got in the mirror and practiced that look <laughs> so that he looked stern. He said a commander has to have the demeanor of a commander. He said, you need command presence. What? Same thing as in the church. Why do we need command presence? Because we're in command. When you, listen, when you walk in the room, if you're born again, when you walk in the room, you are the highest spiritual level being in that room. Every, every other kind of being, demons, angels, whatever it is, they all have to bow to your wishes because you are the highest created spiritual authority in that room and you represent the highest spiritual authority in existence. Right. See, that automatically, and you have to go in there like that. You can't go in there, well, I, I, hope, I hope I've been of some little help. Yeah, we have had all your little help we want, right? <laughs> no, we need a lot of help, right? And you can't walk in there and go, well, we just, we're just gonna do our best. We're just gonna do our best. I wouldn't, um, 
uh, William Booth's daughter uh, was, uh, no, her granddaughter, sorry, his granddaughter. Uh, she was a little girl. <clears throat> and she went off one time to a meeting and did some singing. And when he, she came home, he said, so, <clears throat> how, how'd you do? And she said, well, we did our best. And she thought, you know, that he would like that. And he said, your best? Your best? What good is your best? We don't need your best. We need your all. We need Jesus living through you. You hear that? Yeah. People are like, oh, well, you know, just, just do your best. Don't do your best. Your best falls too short. Do his best. Because it's him living in you. It's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. Expect to do greater, bigger things. Amen? Amen. Over and over, you can read all through Hebrews 11. Everybody there, they did something. Moses forsook Egypt. He had to turn his back on it. He had to leave the palace and go over and live in a mud hut. He had, so he had to live out in the wilderness. Every, every one of these people did something. Faith acts. That's why I tell people, you know, I don't care if you're paralyzed. I don't care what's going on. Do something. If I lay hands on you, do something. I don't care if you can just move your little finger. Move your little finger. Amen? Do something. Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. Then stretch it forth. Amen? If you can't get up, get up. If you can't bend, bend. I was, one time I prayed for this guy, and I said, and it's the strangest thing, because I prayed for him, and I said, here, I, all right, name of Jesus, be healed. And he's like this, and I'm praying. And I said, now, <clears throat> do what you can't do. He said, then I wouldn't touch his toes. And I'm like, I, I didn't want to pray for your back. Was it your back? He goes, no. He said, it had nothing to do with my back. But he said, do what I couldn't do, and I hadn't been able to touch my toes in years. <laughs> Seriously. Had nothing to do with what was ailing him, right? <laughs> People will amaze you, okay? <laughs> I remember I was preaching one time. I think I was out. No, this was in Kansas. I was in Kansas one time, and this person, this little lady came up to me, sweet little woman, sweet, sweet. You know, looked like a little school teacher, a little bun in her hair, and little wire frame glasses, and really sweet. And she comes up there, and I'm standing there, and I said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? And she says, I think I have a devil. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, what, what, what kind of devil you got? What, what, do you spit on the sidewalk? You know, <laughs> what kind of devil you think you got? And she goes, well, every full moon I get in my backyard and howl at the moon naked. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can't, you have to keep a poker face. <laughs> you, you have to, say that. <clears throat> now, what, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do, I wanted to go, what? Did you hear that? Here, say that again. Say that again. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do, but I couldn't. Why? Because all her hope would be gone. So you know what I did? I look at her and go, "Hear it all the time. Let's deal with it right now." <laughs> Why? Well, might not hear that, but I've heard stuff like it. Crazy stuff, right? Stuff that has nothing to do sometimes with what their problem is, you know? You ask them, what can I do for you? My neighbor won't leave me alone. I, we don't, I'm like, I got nothing to do with your neighbor, <laughs> right? You, you want to come over and strong arm your neighbor, tell them to leave you alone, is that what you mean? No, I got, but they tell me all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So, but, so these people will they'll shock you, they'll surprise you, and people say, well, you know, Christianity's boring. Man, I don't know who you're hanging out with. <laughs> I'm telling you, come travel with me a while. You, <laughs> it's anything but boring, okay? You know, for years we prayed and prayed and prayed and said, God, you know, give us an opportunity to minister to people. And it wasn't about being famous. It, that's nothing. That's, you know, that, that comes and goes. I mean, it's nothing. But it's about being able to reach people and touch lives and change lives and create a chain reaction that starts through a family that can go on for generations, right? And so we, we've been on television a lot over in South Africa, that's where we started actually, and we would go over there. And over here, I can go pretty much anywhere and nobody knows me, and, you know, in general places anyway. And so, but I would go to Africa and we would go to the mall 
and because I'm all over TV over there, you know, three times a day and you know five times a week and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just we go over there, <clears throat> and we'll go to a, a Nando's, which is a chicken place, Perry Perry Chicken, if you know what that is. Oh, That's oh. best place to eat right there. That's mm -hmm. and when we're overseas, if there's a Nando's in town, we eat there every day, mm -hmm. every day. I, I'm sure my team wishes. <laughs> you know, it's like. Why did Curry find an endo? Because now we're going to be eating there the whole time. So, but we'll go and we'll go into a mall and we'll find a place to eat or what's called a mug and bean if you're if you know where I'm talking about from from Africa, and it's just good places to eat. You know, just good places. We'll go there and we'll sit and hang out and talk because we're waiting for that evening's meeting or whatever. And, and so we're just sitting there fellowshipping and we'll go out and by the time we go out, somebody will see and they'll tell somebody and pretty soon we'll be heading toward a you know an escalator or something and there'll be somebody will come out and say, Would you, Brother Curry, would you pray for me? Hmm? Yep. So we start praying, psh, there's a line of people half the time. You know, we were there last time. Went into a Christian bookstore, and when this young man, I could tell he recognized me because he's, you know, he's looking at you a certain way, and then he, he takes off, <laughs> he takes off, and he comes back with three or four of his friends. <clears throat> we're walking down the mall, just walking down there, just talking, and, and this guy comes up and he grabs my hand. I think we're just going to shake hands. He grabs my hand, puts it on his head, drops down on his knees, and says, "Pray for me, man of God. Pray for me." <laughs> and I'm like, Okay, isn't, isn't that right? That's, George was there, right? <clears throat> so, you know, and, and, and the thing is, it's not about being recognized. It's about the fact that, and everybody says, you know, man, Curry, you know, slow down, you know, you're going too much, sleep more, that kind of stuff. I'm like, these are the days I prayed for. Yeah. You, you don't understand how hard it was in the beginning. Nobody listened to me. Nobody, you know, everybody thought I, it's the funny thing was, everybody thought I was too young to know anything. And so they didn't listen. I remember one time I thought, man, everybody thinks I'm so young. And because and, at that time I looked a lot younger than I actually was. And so I, I'll never forget because we were staying with my parents for a couple of days. And I went to the store and they had this, um, this spray. And it was, it was, it was gray. <laughs> so I went, I went home. I went to my parents' house and I sprayed it. Right here, okay? And made it look like I had gray hair. Just a little bit. And so I walked in, my mom, I walked past my mom, she goes, have you got gray hair? <laughs> so, so, I thought, well, I figured if I got that, they might think I'm older, might listen to me, right? Because people wouldn't listen to me because they thought I was too young. That's why Paul told Timothy, don't let anybody despise your youth. I know what's in you. I put that in you. Age has nothing to do with faith, yeah. right? There's a bunch of old, <laughs> faithless people, yeah. right? And it's the young people that are bold enough to do the stuff. Yeah, sometimes they do some crazy stuff, but come on. Better to have wildfire than no fire. Yes. Amen? Because you can always tame the fire. Yes, you can. But it's, it's really hard sometimes just to melt an iceberg. You know? And so we've got to get the people out. And so you just, but, and, and all this time, this is, these are the years we look for. It's not about being somebody. It's about being useful for the kingdom of God. Amen. And so we want a greater voice to be able to impact nations. And now we are. God, we, we were faithful with the things that God gave us, and now we are impacting nations. I could tell you stories about Ukraine. I could tell you stories about Poland, about Czech Republic, about Bulgaria, where we, we've already gone to these places. We are changing nations with this message. Amen. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yes. He said this is what we would do, right? When we need to believe him for nations to turn around. And now, and, and God's already told me, you're going to speak to kings. We've already spoke to queens. Might as well speak to kings too. But he's already prophesied and he said, you're going to speak to presidents. You're going to speak to these people. And we've already spoke to high level. Uh, when I was in Ukraine, they put me on a little bitty plane in the middle of the night. We had to fly over the war zone to go into Odessa so we could pray for the finance minister of Ukraine because he was dying of cancer. So we had to go into all these places and we get on the plane, we're flying through the middle of the night and it's late and it's dark and there's clouds and you know, you're getting on there and they're like, you get some sleep and cause it's gonna be a long day because as soon as we get back next day, I gotta preach all day. So I'm sitting in the back of this little bit, you know, the, the plane, the, the tail of the plane gets more narrow as it goes back and I'm, I was the smallest person there. So they stick me in as far back as I can get and the plane is doing like this and I'm like this and then there was another person on this side of me so we're, you know, you're trying not to, you know, be too, close to him as you're kind of like this and trying to sleep and you lean up against the window. So I just fall asleep and at some point I'm hearing this, you know, and I'm, I'm like, what's going on? So I wake up and the pilot is sitting up front in the, the, the dash of the plane, you know, the, the control panel. He's sitting there going, 
because the gauges weren't working. And he's trying to get them to work. And I'm looking at this, and he's looking, and it's far. You can't see nothing outside. And he's trying to get the gauges to work. And I'm like, just go back to sleep. Just go back to sleep. Just go back to sleep. <laughs> You know, that's right. <laughs> you know? And then we, we land and we get there. We have to stay there four hours because once you land a plane, they had to stay four hours before they let it take off again. And they had to refuel it and do all this stuff. So we're sitting there talking two or three o'clock in the morning. Then we got to fly all the way back. And we got lost going back and going over this. And we flew over the war zone and they were thinking, you know, we could get shot down. And I'm like, hey, this is, this is ministry. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? And so we get back. We land in this open field and we get out and they take we go by the hotel all I can do is change clothes and then go right to preach and I preach all day long and then pray for about I don't know 2,500 people that night and I've had you know maybe an hour and a half sleep and then we go back in and we do the same thing the next day and it just keeps going why because these are the days we prayed for you can't pray for this stuff and then gripe about it right you know it's amazing the one thing God really harps on in the Bible griping complaining murmuring, right? Don't do it, right? You do that kind of stuff, don't do it near me. Last time somebody did that, the earth opened up and swallowed 50,000 people, right? Don't do it near me. If you're going to drop down a hole, I don't want to go with you, right? I'm, I'm grateful for everything that goes on. Sometimes it's hard. When I go to the bank, I tell the people, they say, what happened this time? Oh, this happened, and we had to sleep in our clothes because, you know, they were afraid the the you know, soldiers are going to come through and they might have to get us out of there quick. And, you know, aren't you scared when you do that? Said, no, not really. You know, it's a win-win for me. If I go over there and die, I'm a martyr. I'm with Jesus. If I come back, i got a great testimony. Either way, it's a win-win. Amen? Why? Who, who cares what all happens in the meantime? Write it down. Right? Leave it for your kids. Leave it for your grandkids. Got 45 uh, photo albums back there. Well, each one holds 250 to 450 photos. 45 of them, full. Wow. Every nation on earth, well, not every nation, 42 of them. Still another 150 I need to get to. Yep. <clears throat> but uh, we got these books back there, and I can sit down with my kids and open up and say, now this miracle happened there, and this happened here, and I can go through it. That's why we took the pictures we did. It's one of the reasons I really don't like digital the way it is, because for me it's lost in there somewhere. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but do you see, faith acts. There's an action to faith, corresponding action. If you don't act, there's no faith, right? Well, you said you'd have faith for us. Yeah, but how do you even know if you are healed if you won't do, you get up after we pray for you? At some point, you got to do something. you got to act on what's being said. Amen? Amen? Faith hears, it speaks, it talks, it walks, it acts, right? Faith is not just some wispy thing that nobody can put their finger on. Jesus said, Remember when they brought the, the four men, brought the one guy on the stretcher through the roof? Yes. It said, Jesus, seeing their faith. Their, not, not the man's. Their faith. He saw their faith. Jesus can see your faith. And if he ain't seeing you do something, he ain't seeing your faith. Mm. You get Because your faith acts. You got to do stuff you've never done. I had to get outside myself and be somebody I wasn't until I became that person. Why? Because people's lives depended on it. And I didn't have the right to continue the luxury of being myself. So I had to be somebody else, right? And so I found people I wanted to be like and got around them. I got around uh, David Hogan a bit and got pretty wild, right? I got around Dr. Summerall and learned what faith was and got grit and realized, you know what? You can't stop me. To stop me, you're going to have to kill me. And you ain't going to do that because I still got stuff to do. Amen? Amen. Like, kick stands and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. Amen. 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 So, I talked not too long ago about something called a faith project, and I said, what is your faith project? Everybody ought to have a faith project. Something that's important, something that helps people, get a faith project. If you get a faith project, find an action you can tie to it and step out. Amen? Amen. Find somebody that believes like you do and go with them. Work together as a team. Yes. Don't get off separated. Bill, uh, what was it? Uh, Bill Hammond, that's what it was. Bill Hammond used to say, it's the lone banana that gets peeled. <laughs> All right? So, always remember that. Don't, we're not called to be isolated. 
That's one of the worst things about ministry is as you grow, people expect you to be isolated and be separated and have bodyguards and that kind of stuff. We can't do that. We, can't, we have to be examples. We can't be isolated. It's not about, oh, I want to be like that, so I got bodyguards, and so I can be somebody that I have to have body. Come on. We don't need bodyguards. Yeah. Amen? We need to be with the people, meeting with people. We need, people need to realize we're all the same. We're all just folks. That's right. yeah. You know? Yeah. But we all got a big Jesus in us yes, we do. if we just let him out. Yes. Amen? Yes. So let's just be folks, and let's just... Get together. But that also means the reason people have bodyguards is because some people act stupid. Yeah. And they want to treat you like you're somebody and they want to do crazy stuff. And, you know, it just don't act that way. Treat people normal. Yeah. And if you're the person they're trying to treat different, just be normal. Just act normal. Don't let that stuff get to you because we are all normal according to heaven. Amen? Amen? Might not be normal according to the world, but we're normal according to heaven. Yeah. Don't, don't let that happen. Let's just be you know, let's just, let's just be who we were before we became somebody that somebody thought we were somebody else. You, you figure that out. Okay? All right? Father, I thank you. Your word is true. Father, we thank you for all that you went through to send your son and all he went through to purchase us for you. And Father, we just, we give ourselves to you. Spirit, soul, and body. 100-fold consecration. And Father, we just thank you that we can, we reckon ourselves dead to sin and we reckon ourselves alive unto righteousness, alive to you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you even now that by your Spirit, you heal, you deliver, you set free, you bring us into a fullness of all that you have for us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, as your representative and by the authority of the name of your Son, Jesus, I speak to those under the sound of my voice that right now every sickness, every disease, every ailment, addictions and habits, and every work of the enemy in these lives, we forbid to continue. Yeah. In the name of Jesus, right now, we command sickness and disease to go. You will leave and never return. You have no place here. You didn't buy these bodies. You didn't purchase them. They belong to Jesus. And so we give you this eviction notice now. Leave them in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now. Bodies, I speak to you. And I say, be healed and whole. Head to toe. Yes. Nothing left out. Total restoration. Total healing. In the name of Jesus. Right now. Body, be healed. Function correctly. Do your job. Be restored in Jesus' name. Amen. Now right now, you've not been given a spirit of fear but of power, of love, and a sound mind. The work of the enemy in your mind has to cease. Yes. In the name of Jesus, Amen. you have the mind of Christ. And Father, we thank you that as our minds are renewed to your word, your mind, the mind of Christ, operates in us. We thank you, Father. We are protected. We thank you that our faith, our shield of faith, protects us against all the work of the enemy. That, Father, we thank you, and we keep ourselves in your love. And because of that, the wicked one comes and cannot touch us because he has nothing in us. Amen. So in the name of Jesus, according to the word of God, the chastisement of our peace was upon the Son of God, and now we have peace. He left us our peace. So I speak to you now. I speak to your mind, and I say, anxiety, go. Fear, go Amen. right now. And in Jesus' name, peace be to you. Amen. Soundness of mind Amen. in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. 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 Now just take a second and just thank him. And just thank him and just worship him. In Jesus' name. Father, we worship you. You are only to be worshipped. You are everything worth worshipping. There is nothing else that we can put our eyes upon that should in any way try to compete with you for our worship. So we thank you now in Jesus' name. We receive your peace. We receive your life, your love in the name of Jesus. Be glorified. Be made whole right now in a wholeness in Jesus' name. So be it. 
so be it. Amen. 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 All right. Well, you are dismissed. We appreciate you coming. If you need me to lay hands upon you, I'll be glad to do that. Uh, my team will put that together, and we will minister to you uh, in a momentarily. I'm going to go put my things up, and then we will come back out. Other than that, God bless you. Oh, yes, right there. There are ministry cards on the back of each chair. If you want me to minister to you, please fill those out. Bring them with you when you come up front, and then we will function from that. Other than that, God bless. Thank you very much. We will see you next time. God bless. Take my coat. Amen. Amen.